<laughs> and look what it is, my Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Good morning. Today is Monday, March 28, 2022, and I am Kenny Polkari, your host of the party. And there's so much going on, certainly over the weekend and now this week. Lots of economic data. Certainly this continuing crisis in Ukraine is going to dominate the headlines, but a lot of it is going to be about the economic data here in the States. So let's talk about it. What is it that uh, we need to know, right? Last week, stocks tested higher. They did find resistance at 4560, which is a, 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 an area I identified. So we're going to ask, will it try to test it again today? Vlad pushes to take control of the eastern part of Ukraine, while Zelensky reaches out to try to find a solution. Not a surrender, but a solution. China shuts down a city of 25 million people to test for COVID after 50 new cases were reported. That city is Shanghai, and that potentially is going to set us up for some supply chain issues. Oil, taking a small hit on that. But remember, demand remains robust. It's a buy opportunity. And cryptos are advancing. Bitcoin up five thousand dollars since last friday and what do we have for dinner today we're having the braised short ribs over polenta which i made over the weekend and i'll put my picture on twitter make sure you watch it okay look stocks ended the week higher making the second week of higher prices right suggesting that investors think the economy can hold up even as the fed continues to get more and more aggressive in order to fight the building inflation that does not appear to be ebbing at all. In fact, the smart money is betting that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. On Friday, we saw the five-year treasury end the day yielding at 2.63% versus the 30-year bond yielding 259 And that's the first time that the shorter-dated treasury has yielded more than the longer-dated treasury. And that historically suggests a coming recession. Now, you're going to get the argument on both sides. The left is going to, uh, the, the left side of the administration um, and the Fed are going to tell you that it's different this time, that history is not going to repeat itself because the world's in a different place and the old metrics won't work. On the other side, you're going to get the more traditional view that disputes the logic that this time it's different, right? I don't think it is. I think it's going to be tough. You know how I feel about it. In any event, rising inflation exacerbated by the crisis in Eastern Europe and the more hawkish Fed talk. Uh, has only raised the possibility for this potential slowdown. Look, we are going to land. The question is, is it going to be a soft landing or is it going to be full of potholes causing the wheels to come off the plane? Recall my pendulum example from last week. Typically, the pendulum swings too far to the left, thinks zero interest rates and much too much stimulus for far too long, and now they need to correct it. So then expect that they're going to overshoot, causing the pendulum to swing way too far to the right causing a recession, and then they have to try to attempt to fix it uh, and ease up trying to get the pendulum to settle down and swing back just in the middle, right? Swinging slightly left and right. But the question is, what do you think? Will it be a soft landing or will it be a hard one? Because that's going to dictate how you respond or how you invest or how you think about investing. In any event, stocks mostly advanced on Friday. The Dow rose 153 points, the S&P up 22. The Nasdaq lost 24 points, the Russell up two, and the transports gained 57. 10-year treasuries ended the day yielding 2.51%, while oil ended the week at $112.60 a barrel, while gold fell $4.50 an ounce to end the day at 1963. Energy, XLE, the financials, XLF, utilities, XLU, were all the big gainers on Friday. Tech and consumer discretionaries were leading the losers. The SOX, which is the iShares Semiconductor ETF, churned in line after its most recent surge saw it gain 15% in two weeks. And the S&P Metals and Mining ETF, the XME, continues to soar. It is now up 33% since Russia invaded Ukraine five weeks ago. Individual names within that ETF include Cleveland Cliffs, up 88%. Nucor, 35%. AMR, 57%. FCX, 27%. And U.S. Steel, up 77%, all since late February. And they are expected to continue to rally as the Russia-Ukraine crisis remains an issue. And by all accounts, it appears that it's not coming to an end anytime soon. 
So let's just take a quick look at the geopolitics. This morning, word has it that Zelensky is willing to come back to the table to talk, not surrender, just talk about solutions, which includes territorial integrity. Remember, Russia now wants to take control of the whole eastern part of Ukraine, all the way to Odessa, which would give him complete control over the port systems along the Black Sea, essentially rewarding Vlad for invading that country. This is a non-starter for the Ukrainians, and rightly so. They shouldn't be giving up anything. They shouldn't be giving up anything, never mind this whole thing, right? And by now, you also heard about Joey's off-the-cuff ad lib uh, on Friday or, or Saturday when he left, when he gave a speech in Europe before he headed home, saying, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power, suggesting that he was calling for a regime change, something the White House was quick to deny as they went into overdrive trying to explain what he meant, which was a regime, regime change, although it sounded like it was, in any event, it was the topic of conversation on the Sunday news programs as everyone attempted to understand the nuance, right? The question now is, will Vlad respond to that comment or will he remain focused on destroying Ukraine? And if he responds, what will that look like? And then what will the U.S. response be if there is one? It's all very complicated, right? Entangled. All right, so let's go back to the Fed and let's go back to U.S. economic data because this week there's going to be a lot of it, right? Um, now, the recent rally in stocks. Now, the S&P is up 10 and a quarter percent since February 24th, right, when the invasion started. That was the lows uh, of, of February. It is now suggesting that investors are okay with what is expected to be a more hawkish Fed, giving Jay a possible green light to act even more aggressively. And that is where investors are missing it. Now, look, Jay has warned the markets and investors that rates are going to rise 50 basis points in May and then again in June. And if inflation fails to respond by July, then I would expect them to continue with 50 basis point rate hike moves and not the gentle 25 basis point hikes that he initially promised. This morning, Citibank is now projecting 50 basis point rate hikes through September. So that's four 50 basis point hikes or a full 2%. So watch what happens to housing then. Mortgage rates are already hitting 5% for conforming loans. We'll only go higher if this aggressive stance proves true. And that's going to cause housing to retreat along with a bunch of other things. And this is where investors are missing it. They have given Jay a pass and believe that he can engineer a soft landing. And when it becomes clear that it won't be so soft, markets will react and they will reprice as they should, right? Because the inputs change. This morning, U.S. futures are mixed. The Dow's up 18, the S&P's up one, the Nasdaq's down 20, the Russell's down one point. Overnight, we heard that China is shutting down Shanghai locking 25 million people down for about two weeks because of 50 new COVID cases. That's 50 cases in a city of 25 million. They're going to split it in half, the east side of the city from today uh, for the, for, uh, until April 3rd, and then the west side of the city from April 3rd to the 10th, something like that. Maybe it's five or six days. And it makes no sense at all. But then again, this is China we're talking about. None of it makes any sense. But this news is causing oil to fall 4.5% or $5.20 a barrel as the media spins and says, demand destruction, to which I say, it's a buying opportunity. Recall all of the investment banks have a $130, $150 number on oil for this year, with Bank America going so far out the limb that they could see it go to $200 a barrel, as demand will remain robust. But, but, according to Bank America, this spike will cause oil to crash in 2023 as higher oil prices will force inflation even higher, causing Americans to wave the white flag. Besides, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, besides the Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, this week is full of eco data uh, that's going to speak right to the health of the U.S. economy and what we can expect going forward. Wednesday brings us the monthly ADP employment report, expect expectations of 450,000 new jobs. The final revision to the fourth quarter GDP expected to be 7%. Personal income, personal spending, and the all-important PCE deflator. That is the Fed's favorite inflation metric, and that is expected to show an increase of six tenths of a percent month over month and 6.4% year over year, up from last month. Both of these numbers, though, are expected to be higher than the expectations. 
On Friday, we will get the non-farm payroll report, and that is also expected to show an increase of 480,000 new jobs. Unemployment is expected to go to 3.7%, while average hourly earnings are expected to be up 5.5% year over year. European markets this morning are all higher, up between 1.5% and 2% across the board. No specific news other than the geopolitical crisis in Europe. But it appears that investors there are putting that on the back burner. Cryptos lighting up the space again with Bitcoin trading at $47,000, up more than $5,000 from last week, while Ethereum is trading at $3,350, up from $2,800 last week. The S&P closed at $4,543 on Friday after testing as high as 4546 and remember what i said in friday's note there are two key data points on the s p to watch one was 4420 the other was 4560 and thursday night we closed at 4520 so 4560 was only 40 points away or less than one percent this will be key to what happens next and if we kiss it and pierce it then the algos will kick in on the buy side and that's going to cancel supply on the sell side leaving a vacuum causing prices to surge up and challenge the early january highs of 4800. well we almost kissed it and we might try to kiss it again today but i expect that that's going to prove to be resistance right we are in the 4420 4560 range for now at least that's what I think, right? Because I think 4560 is going to prove to be resistance. In the end, remember, investing is not static. It is dynamic. It's long-term. The issues surrounding the markets will fade right now. are going to fade over time, but they're going to continue to cause the volatility in the weeks and months ahead, right? So remember, stick to the plan. Have, uh, have your, uh, you know, stick to your plan. Have your names in place, right? Ones that will provide stability. You know me at the moment. I like the large big U.S. mega cap names, right? Because it's an anxious time and they will provide some stability. Okay, so what are we having for dinner? We have the, the braised short ribs over polenta. So I made this over the weekend. You can see the picture on my Twitter, right? Uh, at Kenny Polcari. But anyway, you're going to begin with six or eight beef short ribs, season them with salt and pepper, and then brown them in a frying pan with a bit of olive oil. Make sure to brown it on all sides, being careful not to burn the meat, but you want them to have like a nice crust on it. After you've browned them, place them in a large, deep baking pan, lining them up on their sides, right? Don't lay them flat. Put them on their sides, right? Because you want these, again, on the bone, not boneless. You want them on the bone. Next, you want to chop up two large white Spanish onions, one bunch of celery, uh, a bag of carrots. You want to smash five or six cloves of garlic. You want to add it to the meat, making sure you disperse the garlic all around. Next, you want to add the chopped veggies right on top of all that. So cover Cover the, uh, the ribs with the veggies, right? Now, in a frying pan that you use to brown the meat, you're going to add one can of beef broth, one can of tomato paste, uh, and about a quarter to a half a cup of, uh, of uh, red wine. Excuse me. Quarter, yeah, a quarter of a bottle of red wine. You want to mix it well. You want to bring it to a boil. You want to let the alcohol steam away. Um, certainly, you want to get it kind of scrape up all the bits on the bottom. Now you want to take this and you want to pour it into the pan. You want to bathe the short ribs um, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in this juice and then cover them really tightly. Put it in the oven 300 degrees for four hours. Maybe you do it at 325 for an hour and then turn it down to 300, but keep it covered tight. When you present it, take it out of the baking dish. You want to puree half the vegetables in a food processor. Uh, and then, on a, uh, and then on, uh, on a plate, you want to put down the the uh, the uh, polenta on the individual plates and then top it with the short rib and then take some of the juice and some of the pureed vegetables and put it all around, right? Put it on top of the rib, put it on top of the polenta. You'll see it in the picture that I gave you. It was so delicious. In any event, uh, the day is just getting started and it's a big week. It is the end of the quarter this week. Thursday is the 31st, so watch for a lot of positioning uh, and window dressing as we go into the end of the quarter. Uh, for marking season. In any event, it's going to be a beautiful day outside. Take good care.